stand together. Going to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints, nor filthiness and foolish talk, or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy or greedy who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Please be seated. <laughs> I want to begin today's message by talking about conversion just for a few minutes. Uh, conversion is the theological word to describe uh, what happens when God saves a sinner uh, and makes him a child of God. That's called conversion. Um, con converts, usually in the historical sense, was basically taking someone from one religion and making and convincing them to be part of another one, another religion. But that's not how we're using that. Conversion is the work of the Spirit of God raising a person in their dead state and making them alive in Christ. That's literally what it means to become a Christian. If you look, turn with me to Ephesians 2. And this can't get any more clearer. Uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. You are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. And then if you jump down to verse 5, it says, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Okay, that is conversion. Okay, that is the day that you become a, a child of God. So it's the power of the Holy Spirit in resurrecting someone who is dead and making them alive in Christ. But here's the real question though. How do you know if this resurrection has occurred? Now in our membership Bible study, we do emphasize this, that if the conversion has happened, if the power of God, as you notice in chapter 1 verse 19 and on, if the same power used to raise Jesus from the grave is used to raise you from your dead state, surely there will be an experiential, something ex something that you will know something has happened drastically in your life. Something's changed. Uh, you don't love the things you do anymore. Something clicked. Okay? But it might be subjective. So how do you objectify this? How, how do you know exactly? I mean, what is the... The number one indication that conversion has actually happened. Again, we're not discounting the fact that you will know subjectively that something traumatic has happened. The, the old life was pulled out and a new new spirit was just, just poured into your soul, into your body. Well, you might be asking, well, what about conviction of sin? Well, the answer is yes, that's how it starts. With John chapter 16, and, and not only uh, mentioned this verse, uh, when he comes, he will convict the world of what? Of sin. But again, it's subjective because it all depends on how the person is responding to that, that piercing of the Spirit of God within. So what is it that indicates that there actually was conversion? Well, turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. You know, sometimes, again, um, 
you know, when you take people through the baptismal class or membership class, and they'll say, you know, I, I, I really have a hard time pinpointing when I was converted. Okay, it's okay. Here is a definitive way to figure out if that conversion has happened. Look at chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. It says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So you start with believing in Jesus Christ. Okay, You are born of God. But notice it continues on, meaning he wants everyone to know if you do believe and you are born of God, this will happen. It says here, whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. What does that mean? It means if you truly believe in Christ and you are born again, you will naturally love others who are also born of Jesus Christ. Meaning, you will naturally love your fellow sibling. You know, when I asked Ian one time, why do you love Lydia? He couldn't really answer. It's just because they're siblings. I, I can't ask him about Ezra because he would probably say, no, no, just kidding. No, okay. Siblings just naturally love each other. Okay. And in the same sense, Christians who are born into the family of God will love others who are born of Christ. So that's the indication number two. Number one, do you believe? And number two, do you love fellow believers? But it goes further. Number three, look at verse two. By this, okay, now he's getting very clear here. By this we know, okay? By this we know. Know what? And notice he doesn't say, by this we know we're saved. He goes, by this we know we love the children of what? Of God. Because some of them might say, okay, I believe in Christ. Yeah, I love that guy. And here John says, well, let me clarify more now. How do we know you actually love your fellow Christian brethren? It says, by this we know we love the children of God when we love God and observe his what? Commandments. Isn't that interesting? Your love for your fellow believer is revealed and displayed when you start obeying the Bible. So it's kind of like, like, it's not like a direct love toward the person that you're trying to love. It's like the Bible stands in between. As you obey the scripture, you will be loving that fellow believer. Why? Almost every commandment in the New Testament is all about serving one what? Another, loving one another, pray for one another, confront one another, encourage one another, right? And, and that's what he's saying. You cannot obey the commandment of God without what? Loving somebody. For this, look at verse 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not what? Burdensome. Yeah, for a true believer, Obeying the commandment of God will never ever feel like a what? A burden. So, how do you know someone is, or how do you know you've truly been converted? Do you obey the commandments in the scripture which tells you that this is the way to love the children of God? And that is how we get back to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn to Ephesians 4 now. This whole idea of walking worthy of God okay, is not, again, just your personal, worthy, you know, purposeful, significant life that you can feel proud about. When Paul says walk worthy, he's not saying, hey, walk in such a way that you'll create a legacy for yourself so that you know, when you are dying and everybody will be like, oh, yeah, this guy was such a great guy and he's done this and he's donated money here and... This building, we're going to name it after him. He's truly worthy. That is not what Paul is saying at all. The word worthy is weightiness or of equal weight of all that's mentioned in chapters 1 through 3. And your life is to equate that depth of 
privilege that you've been given for being called from from before time began to be his child, to be resurrected, to be indwelt with the Spirit of God, to be displayed to the angels, the wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God in Ephesians chapter 3. But in the particular sense, he's, he's saying the way you walk worthy is when you build up the people in the church. Look at verse 2. With all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of recalling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So there's one, one, but to each one of us, different gifts were given. Why? So we can serve each other. Basically, if you want to summarize like this, the worthiest walk that anyone can walk in this life is to be completely devoted to the church. Loving the church, expending your energy in the church, growing in the church, seeing your children grow in the church, generations of children being born, and the church just gets built up. And as I say the word church, we're not talking about the universal big church, the church of all the ages and nations. We're just talking about one local church. We are responsible for one local body of Christ. There are people who feel like they're like call for every church. You know, I'm a pastor of, I'm on in, I'm a YouTube pastor for all these churches. That is so bad. That is so unbiblical to think that you are appointed, right, <laughs> as the shepherd of all the all the churches. Now, you know, John MacArthur's ministry with his radio show, and he's so encouraging to this everyone, but he never views himself as, oh, yeah, I'm the minister of these people over here. Uh, there was one church that actually called him. He, he shared this during a uh, seminary chapel. He said, yeah, this one church called me, and, and they said they claimed me. They claimed me to be their pastor. Uh, it was a charismatic church. They said, we claim John MacArthur to be this church's pastor. And they, they sent him a letter and said, you must come. And he said, no, <laughs> I am a pastor and elder appointed to Grace Community what? Church. You have been appointed to Titus Bible Church. I have been appointed. Alan has been appointed to Titus Bible Church. If you truly want to die one day and wonder, have I walked worthy of God? Well, if the church, if you were committed to the ministry and you've built people up, you've expended your energy so that people have grown because of your input and your involvement, you have walked worthy. You will be commended. It doesn't matter how much money you made or what you've did in this life or whatever. Okay, it's what you've done to the people here. That is the worthy walk of God. You know, when we went to seminary, man, all of us wanted to be like John MacArthur. It was like this, we're all starstruck. You know, and sometimes we sign up to go to seminary because we're going to be as famous, you know, as him. You know, thousands of people, and and sometimes the the during the preaching class, they're like, "Do you want to sound like MacArthur?" And everyone's like, "Yes, right." It's gonna attract all these people, and then we get out of seminary, and we're like a little youth pastor, and it's only the children, and then we're waiting for that day when the world will show up at the church door, and it never happens. And then we realize as we grow, it we it, we we become sobered up. Walking worthy is not being ministry famous before others and finding you know a, a huge church to be recruited by it's it's walking worthy in the local church that god has placed us in so chapters four five and six we can outline it in three main points the attitude of walking worthy the means of walking worthy and the practice of walking worthy okay we've covered the attitude the attitude of lowliness, the attitude of patience, love, humility. Uh, we looked at the means of walking worthy. That's the, the elders, the pastors, the teachers of the church who instruct us through the word. That's the means by which we can walk worthy. Now, the specifics or the practical aspect starts in verse chapter 4, verse 17, and all the way to chapter 6, verse 9, the practice of walking worthy. 
there's two areas we need to practice and the two areas are attitude and relationship okay attitude and relationship so that's what we're going to focus on and there's a lot of sub points here okay if you want to practice walking worthy that you need to work on your attitude number one an attitude of love okay? you need to be loving okay an attitude of love it has to be a, a love that imitates God. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. It says, imitate God, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. It must be submissive love. Okay, uh, Walk in love just as Christ gave himself. Okay, A perfect love just as Christ. A sacrificial love, again, just as Christ, who gave, who gave himself up as an offering and a sacrifice to God. Your love must be like God, it must be submissive, it must be perfect, and it must be sacrificial. That's the attitude of love. The second attitude is the attitude of purity, and this is where we are in verses 3 to 6. Last time, we covered the purity of the heart. Verse 3, sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not be named among you as is proper among saints. And today, we're going to look at verse 4, purity of speech okay if you want to walk worthy you need to work on this attitude an attitude of being pure absolutely pure now all of us struggle with purity okay in the areas of our heart in the areas of our temper okay our temperament patience okay but we need to resolve to keep working on that but number two, we have to work on our speech. Okay, look at verse four. Nor filthiness and foolish talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Now, I think it's pretty obvious. Like, I don't need to go really in depth to this, but I'm just going to uncover some of the, the original Greek words to just give some insight. The word filthiness, okay, it's referring to behavior that flouts um, social and moral standards that are shameful, that are obscene. It literally means ugly. Okay? It, filthiness is ugly. Okay? And it, it's going to, it's not just talking about the action part, but the, the, the speech. It says, more filthiness and foolish talk. The word foolish uh, in the Greek is moral logia. It, it's made up of two words. Moral, where we get the word moron, and logia, which means words. So moronic words. That's the implication. And, and the idea is not so much don't be a moron. It, it's referring to speech that just doesn't make sense. Speech that just well, let me explain. Uh, let me read to you John MacArthur's explanation, and I quote: "It is stupid talk." Talk only befitting someone who is intellectually um, deficient. Now, don't don't misunderstand that to mean like you're not educated, okay? And I could let, let me continue the quote. It is sometimes referred to as low obscenity, foolish talk that comes from like a drunkard with a gutter mouth. It has no point except to give an air of dirty worldliness. Now, if you think about that, you've heard this amongst unbelievers especially. They drink or they talk or they're talking in the restroom or something and you are passing by and you hear them just pouring out the filth of moronic, useless, senseless jargon of just immorality, impurity, there's always these innuendos about something, okay? And then it says here, coarse jesting, okay? Coarse jesting. Now, this is not talking about humor, okay? I think the scripture, if you read it enough, there, there's, you know God is humorous, okay? He, is, he, he, he developed humor, but coarse jesting, there's a Greek word for this. It's talking about risque talk, vulgar humor. Uh, when you, if you ever, if you've ever listened to just like a secular um, uh, comedian, it's always that. It, it's just coarse jesting. There's always just sickening innuendos and risque talk. 
our speech must be free from all of that. Now, as I look at my past, I realize growing up in Garden Grove, it began third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. I remember some of the things that our friends, we talked about. And it was so bad, so perverse. And I'm thinking, as I look at my children, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, how in the world can that have happened? We, you know, me growing up, we were always on the streets. We did not, I was outside at school. When I came home, just had something to eat, and I went back outside. Rode bicycle all day with our friends. All we did was just talk, 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 and all we did was talk dirty things. And it is so shameful as I think back at how foolish, moronic, coarse jesting, no giving of thanks. It was just filthy. But notice here, our speech is to be devoid of those things, but it is supposed to give indication of thanksgiving. Okay? But rather giving of thanks. Okay? Giving of thanks. It's as if to say, the solution to your difficulty with your speech is this one thing. Start being what? Thankful and start saying thankful things. That's really what the scripture says. That's literally it. It says, stop all of this filth. Start giving thanks. It's amazing. It's, it's not complicated. It's just so profound that this is going to take care of our speech. Uh, yesterday, I at the at the hospital, um, the way they designed it, uh, the parking structure was like here, and the entrance of the hospital was like literally here. It felt like half a mile. Okay, it was so far, and they actually have like a shuttle system to go kind of like you know back and forth. Um, you know, with that um, the limousine golf cart. Have you ever seen those? Golf cart only holds like two, but this is like a stretch limo golf cart. It's got like four or five rows of people, and and they would just go back and forth picking up people. And um, yeah, yesterday, like the Lord was so kind to me. Uh, the parking attendants were just so nice. <laughs> They're like, "Sir, um, I'll call the golf cart for you," and like. You know, and then the parking valet person, I didn't want to pay valet. And the lady was like this old Filipino grandma lady. She's so funny. She's like, <laughs> you know, and so I was parked. I was waiting for my, I was, trying, I was just trying to get by. And then she goes like that. Looks like I was like, do -do 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 -do. she goes, please come in. I was like, okay. And then, and then when I got out of the car, she said, would you like a shuttle? I mean, there's a lot of people. And I was like, only me? Wow. Parking fairy does here, okay? Uh, anyways, the reason I mentioned this is because after I came out of the hospital on the way back, the shuttle was there. And this lady was sitting next to me. And I was like, you know, I was trying to be funny. I was like, you know, whoever designed this parking structure, it needs to be fired. <gasps> And, I, and then I said, you know, I don't need to sound like I'm complaining. And I was like, oh, what did I just do? I didn't give thanks. I should have been thankful, but trying to be funny, I ended up saying the wrong thing. The point is, every moment that you're able to say something, always try to interject something you're what? Thankful about. Okay? Yeah, and I, I wish I can go back and redo that, <laughs> that, that moment there. Um, but... Giving thanks. Now think about this. When we talk about the character of a man, what are we referring to? Have you thought about that? Oh, he's got great character. Like, what are you talking about? It's from what he what? What he says. Right? We never realize that sometimes. We think about someone's character. Oh, he's what? You watch him honestly? He's an honest behavior kind of guy? What does that even mean, right? It's, it's what comes out of his mouth. We make our judgments about their character from what they say. And notice that in this text, the Holy Spirit is stating that those who are in darkness will reveal speech that are coarse, filthy, immoral, moronic. But Christians are people who are giving thanks. 
And again, you're like, that's all you're going to say. Well, that's what the text says. Thanks. And so at this, I thought, okay, then why are Christians so thankful? Obviously, because of all the things mentioned in chapters 1, 2, and 3, we're chosen before the foundation of the world. We were dead in sin. We're alive in Christ. We're made one with the body of Christ. Basically, the Christian cannot help but be what? Thankful. And so walking worthy of God is one who is always giving thanks throughout the whole day. Everything about the believer is to be one of thankfulness. Those of you who know Romans one twenty one, right? Even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give what? Thanks. What does that mean? It means the worship of God fundamentally comes down to one thing. Thanksgiving. Do you guys remember 1 Chronicles 29 verses 11 to 13? Let's turn to that passage. It's, this is so profound. 1 Chronicles, he's they're praying and worshiping God. And at the very end, he mentions one thing, thanksgiving. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 verses 11 through 13. And King David is blessing and worshiping Yahweh. Verse 10, so Yahweh bless Yahweh. I'm sorry, David bless Yahweh in the sight of all the assembly. David said, Blessed are you, O Yahweh, the God of our God of Israel, our Father, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Yahweh, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the kingdom, O Yahweh, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Riches and honor come from you. You rule over all. In your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now you say all that. What? How do you end? He ends by saying, verse 13, So now, our God, we are thanking you and praising your glorious name. There's no fitting conclusion to the glory of God in the response of a sinner than to simply be what? Thankful. And I would like to say th say like this, being thankful is the highest expression of worship. Is the highest expression of worship. What is the last commandment? Don't covet, right? The first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods, what? For me. What is that? You're thankful of who God is and you shall not seek anything what else. And that's what thankfulness is. Turn back to Ephesians 5. When a person is filled with the Spirit of God. And this is a good indicator because you might be wondering, how do I know if I'm filled with the Spirit right now? The simple answer to that is, are you thankful? Because look at chapter 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Because when you are, verse 19, you'll begin to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, meaning you'll be joyful, happy, singing and making melody with your heart. And look at verse 20, always giving what? Thanks for some things. For what? all things and that is the challenge right thankful for everything everything includes bad things your child is screaming you've done all you can and they're screaming at four in the morning somehow you need to start saying thank god <laughs> you know you lost your job and you got to praise God. Why? He's going to give you another one. And even if he doesn't, you thank him because he's testing you to see if you'll trust in him. He's crippled you. You should thank God. Why? Well, he didn't take the other limb. <laughs> you know? There's always something he's going to be giving you or taking away from you or uh, afflicting you or blessing you to see if you will be what? Thankful. Always giving thanks for all things. Turn to Colossians 3. 
Okay. The girl said no. She doesn't want to go out with you. Be thankful. Looking at somebody. <laughs> College students. Okay. Verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving what? Thanks. It's, it's a participle, meaning as you're going throughout your day, it's just happening continually. Being thankful again and again and again. It's not stop and be thankful. It's just walk in thankfulness. Give thanks in all things. Grumbling is a sign, an indication you are still in darkness. Turn to Philippians. Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul says, do all things without what? Grumbling. Yeah. Or disputing. So that you will be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish. Where? In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know what he's saying? The greatest beacon of light and testimony is a thankful person because everyone in darkness is doing the very what? Opposite. That's why I just really feel guilty about yesterday. You know? Just really want to go back. Get on that little bus. But that lady's got to be there too. And the driver. Okay? But I realized, wow! It's so easy to be what? Complaining. You know? I mean, okay. Before God... I was thankful. <laughs> but my flesh just squirted out a comment of what? Complaining. You know, trying to be, you know, funny. It's so easy. It's just a natural, dark thing that we do. It is an indication of our flesh that we would complain. And so we have to fight this battle and always be what? Thankful. Guys, practice this. Every moment, just say, thank God for this, thank God for that, thank God for this, thank God for that, and just practice that and try to catch yourself from ever what? Complaining about anything. Let's go back to chapter 5, Ephesians 5. Now here, Paul's warning gets very, very severe. He says in verse 5, For this you know, okay, now, the English word says with certainty, but in the Greek, it's just one word. Ginosko or ginos contest. It's a participle. You guys all know ginosko, like I know, is usually a word used for a husband knowing his wife in a very intimate sense or God knowing us. And he uses this word to say that you truly, intimately, inwardly know that this is true. You know this to be a fact. That no one who is like this is going to go to heaven. That's what he's saying. For this you know with certainty that no sexually immoral, no one sexually immoral, or impure or greedy who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. It's really crazy today to see Christians committing immorality and thinking they're going to go to heaven. I don't sense fear or trauma in their conscience anymore. It's like, oh yeah, we've been, you know, intimately involved. And they just act like it's a natural thing when they should be on their knees trembling, wondering if God is going to put this verse on them. It's a frightening verse. He's saying, you know in your conscience that God is not going to accept you if you talk like this, if you complain like this, and if you are like this in your heart, you're impure, you're greedy, you're immoral, heaven is not a place for these kinds of people. Heaven is a place where these people were like this and they've repented. They stopped. We've covered the immoral, the impure, the greedy. And here's an interesting uh, part to this. Someone who is greedy, and Paul says, who is an idolater. The word greedy 
uh, refers to someone who desires more than what is, what is due. And Paul is saying, if you're greedy, it's connected with an idolater. What, what's an idolater? Someone who worships an idol, a false religious person, someone who doesn't truly worship the one true God. And so how is greed connected with idolatry? Well, it is. That's the point. Being greedy is not a small sin. It is a great sin. It is on the equal level of an idolater, someone who worships a false god. It's the same parallel when Jesus said, if you lust, you've committed what? Adultery in your heart, right? If you're greedy, you are a what? An idolater. You are a worshiper of idols. You hate God. That's what he's saying. Greed is an indication that you do not worship the one true God. You're after something else. Or in, in, in this sense, everyone in false religion are part of that because of greed. They want more than what God has allotted to them. And the references in the New Testament with greed and idolatry, it's so much. There's one in Colossians 3 verse 5. Let me read this to you. It says, Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. He says, I do not at all mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with greedy or swindlers or with idolaters. Again, greed and idolatry. And turn with me to 1 John 5, 21. It is quite significant that John ends the letter with this. Chapter 5, verse 21. Little children, guard yourselves from what? Idols. That, that's, that's how he ends his letter. It's like you write an email to somebody and at the end you're like, guard yourself from idols. Just like out of nowhere, you just interject that in there. Why? Because John knows how easy it is to fall into idolatry. And it's not meaning that you somehow flip out of Christianity and start worshipping Buddhism or Islam religion. He's saying you can actually convince yourself that you're worshipping God, but you're not. You are actually an idol worshipper. And one indication of that is there's greed. Or let's put it this way, there's lust. Lust is the, is the same thing. You, you want, you want, you want, you are insatiable. And what it ultimately does is this. Because you're so greedy, you begin to put yourself as God. That's what it ultimately comes down to. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You become the very God that you worship. A greedy person is one who is so consumed with what he wants that he becomes the very God that he desires to satisfy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, Know this, that in the last days, difficult times will what? Will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, without gentleness, without love for good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of what? God. Holding to a form of godliness but denying its what? Power. And then he talks about those who teach false religion. But look at how verse 1 begins. Of verse 2, men will be lovers of self, and it ends by saying lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of what? God. Lovers of pleasure, that's another way of saying he is greedy. He's greedy. You know, when our children show signs of greediness, it's a sign that they're idolatrous. It's not a small sin. You want to train that child 
to never be greedy. You need to teach your child that what you have there is not yours. It's an allotment from God to you to see if you'll use that, okay, for the benefit of others. It begins at a very young age that you do not possess anything. It's not your right. It's God who gave that to you. Tyndale New Testament Commentary says this, and I quote, For passion, whether for money or for indulgence, is in effect putting an idol and an object of desire and worship before God. To the Jew, idolatry was the worst of sins. And perhaps, he's quoting another commentator, Bruce is right in saying that the part which the, command, the, part which the commandment against covetousness played in Paul's own spiritual experience no doubt made him acutely aware of the special deadliness of this subtle sin. And what he's saying is that this commentator Bruce thought Paul must have struggled so much with greed and idolatry that he emphasizes this with, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Do not be greedy. Okay? Be thankful and give. The sin of greed and idolatry are always mentioned together. It's a violation of the second commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods, or thou shalt not make an idol, okay, an image to represent God. <clears throat> and so going back to Ephesians chapter 5, this you know with certainty, someone who is immoral, sexually immoral, impure, and greedy. He is an idolater and he will not be given the inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God unless the person what? Repents. And then if, if that wasn't enough, he, he furthers the, the intensity of the warning. Look at verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Okay? The word empty there, he's saying it amounts to nothing. Okay, it's empty, it's devoid of any value. He's saying, don't listen to other people. And he's referring to the Gnostics. There were these groups called the Gnostics at that time that taught that if even if you sin, because Jesus forgave you internally, you will never lose your salvation. So you can sin all you want. All You can do whatever you want physically. It's not going to affect your spiritual life. Now, um, that is absolutely wrong. Physical actions affect the spiritual. And I can take a whole hour to explain this, but we're not going to go into that. Okay? What you do outwardly affects yourself inwardly, spiritually as well. And Paul is saying, don't let anyone deceive you with these empty words. And then he makes it clear, for because of these things, these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The phrase sons of disobedience is found also in chapter 2, verse 2, okay, when it says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the power of the ruler of the air, the spirit is that, that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That phrase, sons of disobedience, means someone who's not converted. God's anger will come upon those who are living this way because it imitates those who are not His. They're not children of God. They're not sons of Christ. They're sons of disobedience. And Paul is warning them, you live like this, the wrath of God will come in the form of very, very difficult discipline. Do not allow immorality to continue in your heart and in your mind. Do not let any form of greed to come in your heart. The wrath of God comes because of these things that are evident in the sons of disobedience. To demonstrate how bad this anger of God is, turn with me to Numbers 25. You know, once in a while, you have to go back to the Old Testament and read how severe it is to test the patience of God. 
you know, today he's being today the Lord is just so patient and kind. And we forget he's angry. The the, the book of Psalm Psalm, I think it was five or seven, says, You are a God who has indignation every day. Everyone emphasizes God is just love. Like he's up there just filled with love. Hearts are just coming out of his throne. No. He's in heaven looking upon earth. He sees the righteous and the unrighteous. He sees the, the, the sons of God and the sons of the devil. He sees all of their sins. And then he also sees the sins of Christians. And he's angry. But he's patient, but he's angry. That's what the wrath of God means. The anger of God, the displeasure of God. And if you read this passage, it reveals that. It says in verse 1, And Israel remained at Shittim, and the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab, meaning they began to sleep with them. Indeed, they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the anger of Yahweh burned against Israel. Verse 4, And Yahweh said to Moses, Take all who are the heads of the people and execute them. Just kill them. In broad daylight before Yahweh, so that the burning anger of Yahweh may turn away from Israel. Now this is crazy. This is the God of love that everyone's talking about. This God of love tells Moses, kill them because that's how my anger is going to be appeased. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill. This is just, this just boggles my mind. If I was one of the judges of Israel, like an elder, and Moses came up and said, now pick up your sword. You're going to kill your brother, brothers and sisters who are sinning. I, I can't imagine having to do that. Each of you kill his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. And then out of nowhere, so this is going on, and this idiot, okay, this idiot, look at verse 6. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought near to his brothers a Midianite woman. In broad daylight, while they're mourning and they're worried about the situation, this one idiot comes in holding this girl's hand, excited about what he's going to do with her. It says, in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregations of Israel, while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. They're weeping, crying, praying to God for patience and mercy, and the guy had the nerves to just walk through them Holding this woman because all he can think about is, is, is sin. And Phineas. Now, God's, God is seeing this kid, whoever this young man is. And Phineas, the Lord moves his heart, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest. Now, this is, this is, this is burning righteous anger of a man. He seizes and he's so upset. How can you do this to God? How can you bring sin here? He picks up a spear. He goes after the man in verse 8 into the tent and then he pierces both of them because they're both lying down. He drives it right through. Can you imagine that? And then it says here, through the man of Israel and the woman, through the body, then the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. And those who died by the plague were 24,000 people. 24,000. I can't even imagine just visually what that looks like. But 24,000 people died in one day. Why? God was upset. Do not sin. Do not test the patience of God. Do not allow immorality to continue. 
Do not let sins of your heart continue. Keep your mind pure. Be thankful. Do not complain. Do not be greedy. For because of such things, the wrath of God, what? Comes upon the sons of disobedience. You know, in one sense, as we meditate on this, we should all be dead, right? We should all be dead right now. None of us could have made it this far. Despite all the sins we committed, it's purely by God's wonderful patience and what? And grace. And so the true believer to walk worthy must put aside these things because of his fear of what? God, I want to go to heaven. I want to be part of the kingdom. I must not allow this. That's how you're supposed to think through this. It's not, oh, I believe in God. I know I'm saved. If I sin, I'm still going to go to heaven. No, the fear is, if I keep letting this sin continue in my life, I will not be allowed entrance into the kingdom of God. I must what? I must turn away. I must repent. Because it's warning me, those who are like this shall not receive the inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and of God, and that's why Paul says in verse 7, therefore do not be partakers with them. Going back to Ephesians 5, and we'll cover this next time. Do not be partakers with them. This from verse 7 to 13 is an attitude of separation. We have the attitude of love, verses 1 to 2. We have attitude of purity, verses 3 to 6. Okay, Purity in heart and purity in speech. And now, you must okay, have an attitude of separation. Paul says, do not partake this with them. We'll talk about that more next time. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we tremble because we all have sin so much oh father we repent and we humbly seek your 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 grace your merciful hand and father we pray for much wisdom to discern the the deep secret hidden motives of our heart and we want to expose them by your by your light by your word and repent from that, that we will be pure in our heart and in our speech and our mind, that we will no longer be as we will once were, we once were sons of disobedience. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your patience. When we read the account in Numbers and those people died, Father, we, we should not be alive. But you, by your grace, has mercifully endured our sin, uh, receiving us through Christ and forgiving us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the Spirit sealed to us. Father, would you strengthen us and make us more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.